Um, and he said he's going to share a little bit about how, what happened, how he got to be in this church in the first place. So with that said, let's hear it from Brett. Good morning. Uh, am I on? Oh, you see it? I don't see it. Oh, I hear it. <laughs> it's good to be here this morning. I can't put it into words, actually, because uh, 40 years ago, I was about where Bill is right now, as a, maybe a six-year-month-old, being dedicated here at this church. So it's almost like a a little bit of a homecoming for me. Um, my parents were both saved in this church in the 1970s. And it's amazing, 50 years of God's faithfulness here at this church. And um, God's been good. God's been good. And it's amazing how, how God can work in mysterious ways. About 22 years ago... Um, my second brother, my middle, the middle son of my uh, siblings, of my mom, uh, was getting ready to go to Bible college out in Columbia, uh, Gary, Indiana. And my dad was not really particular on the college. He wanted us. He wanted my brother to go to a, a college in Columbia, South Carolina. So what he did was he came to this church and he got. One of these. Does anybody know what this is? I know, these, these are foreign to the young, youngsters. A cassette tape. He got a cassette tape of the founding pastor here, Morgan Jones. And he gave it to my brother to try to dissuade him to not go to the college in, in Indiana, but go to the college where he graduated from in Columbia. And ever since then, 22 years ago, I've collected every single one of these that were produced right back there. Every one. And I've been listening to them for 22 years. And the lessons I have learned from them have come from where I am standing right now. By God's grace and by God's power and God's amazing, amazing way, I've learned most of what I know about this book from the man of God that was standing right here. So you can just imagine the emotions I feel to be standing right here sharing with you today. Today I want to talk about a man in the New Testament that had an amazing gift. And his, and his name is Barnabas. Let's turn to Acts chapter 4 this morning in your Bibles. And I think we live in a day and age where we need this. Oh, we need this. Acts chapter 4. The church has just begun on, in Acts chapter 2 at Pentecost. And has continued in Jerusalem. And there was a man in that church by the name of Joseph. We don't know him by that name, do we? We know him by the name of Barnabas. That was his nickname. Let me just read to you um, Acts chapter 4, starting in verse 31. And when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. And the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and one soul, not one of them claimed that anything that belongs to himself was his own, but all things were common property to them. And with great power, the apostles were giving witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and abundant grace was upon them all. For there was not a needy person among them, for all who were owners of land or houses were selling them and bringing the proceeds of the sales and laying it at the feet of the apostles. And they would be distributing it to each other, any that were in need. And Joseph, a Levite, a Sephirian birth, 
who was also called Barnabas by the apostles, which means translated son of encouragement. This morning I want to talk about that, not just his life, but what he was, an encourager. Encouragement is what we need. It's, we need it so much. Let's pray and we'll get into today's message on encouragement and Barnabas. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to share your word, to open it up and learn from it and be encouraged by it and share it with special people in a special place. Lord, we thank you for today. Be with us now. Let your spirit be moving and let him show us what only you he can show through his word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So he's mentioned there for the first time, Barnabas, in verse 36. And we don't hear from him again until Acts chapter 9. But in between 4 and 9, what happens to the church? The church in Jerusalem would start to become persecuted by a man named who? By a man named Saul. Saul of Tarshish. This man would ravage the church. It says that in Acts chapter 1, verse 3. He would persecute the church. He would find Christians and make them recant their faith. And this is what was going on at that time in the first church in Jerusalem. And at that time, God was going to come down from heaven in Acts chapter 9 and save the persecutor of the church. It's amazing how God works, isn't it? How in mysterious ways he, he, picks, he picks men. If you were God, would you pick a persecutor of the church to do so much for him? But this is what God does in Acts chapter 9. He comes down in a voice and he says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul answers in verse 5 of Acts 9, Who are they, Lord? Who are you? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. And from that point on, the apostle, who would become the apostle Paul, would accept Christ as Savior and be born again. And God was going to use him. He said to Ananias, who was going to be the a helper to get, uh, to, to get Paul back on his feet, Jesus said to Ananias, I will show this man how much he must suffer for my name's sake. And Paul would go on to do many things and suffer many things. But before Paul could get there, there's a, there's a part in the Scripture that I want us to look at. It's in Acts chapter, 20, uh, chapter 9 and verse 26. Remember now, God has chosen this man, Saul from Tarshish. God chose him for a specific purpose, and that was to build the church, to, to, to send this, the church out and make it grow, and even so today. And it says in Acts uh, chapter 9, verse 26, And when he, talking about Saul, had come to Jerusalem, he was trying to associate with the disciples. We know who the disciples are, right? Or the main disciples, the apostles. And they were afraid of him. Do you blame them? They know who Saul is. They know this man's name. They know what he has done over the years. So they were afraid. Thinking he's not really, a, they were probably thinking he's not really an apostle. He's just trying to find out where we hide out so he can take us off to prison. And maybe this is what they're thinking. But he said, wait, they said that in the rest of verse 26, not believing that he was a disciple. They're thinking, they thought he was tricking them. But thank God, verse 27 is in our Bibles. Actually, the first two words of verse 27 I circled and underlined. But Barnabas. But Barnabas took Paul and brought him to the apostles, and described to them how he had seen the Lord on the road, Acts chapter 9, and that he had talked to him, and how in Damascus he had spoke out boldly in the name of Jesus. So, this man with this gift and encouragement took a man that no one else believed, and many for had good reason, but Barnabas was willing to take a chance on Saul to use his gift of encouragement and give Saul a chance. 
And thank God he did. If he didn't, where would half of our New Testament be this morning? If he didn't, where would be the churches that he planted all over the Roman Empire? Where would we be if he didn't travel 9,000 miles of his day, talking about Paul, preaching the Gospel, many times with Barnabas, preaching the Gospel, bringing people to Christ. It was because but Barnabas. That's an amazing thing. It's a wonderful thing that he was willing to give Saul a chance when no one else did. So I wonder, when's the last time or have you ever thanked God for Barnabas? Because where would we be without him? Now I tell you one thing. I don't think God, I don't know, of course, I'm not God. I don't think God came to Barnabas that, that previous night and said, you know, Barnabas, that, you know, that Saul that you've heard about, I saved him, and you know what? You better go encourage him and give him a chance because you know what? He's going to write half our New Testament. He's going to travel 9,000 miles of his day planting churches. You better do it, Barnabas. I have a feeling God didn't do that. I feel that God, Barnabas said, Lord, you can do anything. And if you choose to, Saul, uh, to save a persecutor like Saul, I'm going to believe you. I'm going to trust you. And I'm going to give you a chance. And Barnabas did. And because he did, we are here this morning. Because one man used his gift of encouragement, changed history. Now that's, that's Barnabas. That's not me, is it? Or is it? What gifts do you have this morning? Maybe you don't have the gift of encouragement. Maybe you have the gift of hospitality. Maybe you have the gift of prayer. Maybe you have a gift of, of whatever the, 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 the Bible talks about from the Holy Spirit. What you do with that is so super important. We don't know what, we, what could happen if we just encourage one person to continue or to give them a chance. Barnabas didn't know but he did it anyway. And that's an incredible thing. It's an amazing thing and how important it is to find someone that you can encourage. And God can do amazing things with that. As we continue in the story of Barnabas, the next time we see him is in Acts chapter 11. And between Acts chapter 9 and 11, the church is growing all over the areas. It's not just in Jerusalem because of the persecution. The believers are scattered throughout that, that land. And there's a church in Antioch that is growing. People are coming to faith. God is adding to their numbers. And this news reaches Barnabas in the church that's in Jerusalem. It tells us that in Acts chapter 11 and verse uh, 22. Well, verse 21, And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a large number who believed turned to the Lord. And the news about this reached the ears of the church in Jerusalem. I like to think of that as the mother church, and there's churches all around that orb. And the, and the news reached the church at Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas off to Antioch. I like to think... If I was in that church, why did they pick Barnabas? I wonder why. I wonder if they could have picked someone else. But they chose Barnabas, and I think they chose Barnabas for a specific purpose. They knew who he was and what he can do. They knew the gift he had. And this is what happens in verse 23. And when he had come, Barnabas, he went to Antioch. That, by the way, that's 400 miles north of Jerusalem. And he came all that way to witness the grace of God, verse 23, and he rejoiced and began to encourage them with a resolute heart to remain true to the Lord. That word res uh, resolute heart really means purpose of heart. So he came to Jerusalem, witnessed what God was doing there, and what he do. Just like he did with the Apostle Paul, he encouraged the believers there in Antioch. 
He encouraged them to stay true to the faith, to continue on in the work of the Lord. And the Lord revealed to me this, 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 just this morning how Barnabas was sent to a, a church of like faith. And I think maybe God sent me here this morning to do exactly what Barnabas did. To see what God is doing. And to hear some of the, uh, some of the things you're planning on doing and see how the Sunday school is going well. And to see how you're staying true to faith. I'm here this morning to, continue, to encourage you to stay true and continue what you're doing. Isn't that something how God still works the same way? And I'm honored to do that, to be here. For Barnabas, it says in verse 24, for he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And a considerable numbers were brought to faith there in the church of Antioch. And this is an amazing church because this is where we were first called Christians, wasn't it? Verse 26. So Barnabas went up there and he encouraged his church. He's just using his gift. He's just using what God gave him. And people were being saved and people were being uplifted and things were getting done for God. You see how just one man can make a big difference? One man using the gift God gave him and the work continues. That's what Saul is. That's what he did. And we can do the same. All we have to do is give it a little encouragement. When I think about what what Barnabas did, I think of a story that my professor gave when I was in college. And my, my professor was a, it was he was a great man, but he struggled with depression. He just struggled with uh, a lot of different things. He had a lot of health issues, his back, his knee, you name it. And he was a professor of Bible, but struggled with depression, really bad. And there was many times where he couldn't make it to co- class. Because the devil was speaking into his mind while he was walking across campus, saying to him, you shouldn't be teaching. You feel so down in the dumps. How can you be encouraging young students in the Bible? How can you be doing that? Why don't you just go home? That's what the devil was speaking to my professor. One time it was so bad he had to close class and said, I just can't teach anymore today. Went home. He went back to his office and just Lay down a couch that he had in his office. He told me a story with that, that day something incredible happened. While he was on that couch and feeling this down in the dumps, he heard a knock on his office door. It was a colleague of his who had known his history and known uh, he's, he struggles. The door was unlocked, thank God. He just walked in. Didn't say a word. And just came, took a chair. Saw his his friend sitting on the couch, just rolled off. Took a chair, put it next to the couch, and sat there. And prayed. Just sat there. Didn't say a word. My professor said later that day that was such an encouragement to him. That one man, one colleague, was willing to come in my time of despair, my time of need, was willing to come in and just sit with me and encourage my heart. One person can make a difference. It really can. That's what Barnabas is like. He's come to sit there and give you a little bit of encouragement. The word encouragement really means to be called to one's aid. That's what it means. And that's what we're talking about this morning. As we continue on in, in the book of Acts, we see Barnabas come up again. The church of Antioch, which where um, Barnabas and Saul would stay there and, and work with, would eventually send them out on missionary journeys. And they would go on their first missionary journey in chapter um, 13. 
But in, and it says in Acts chapter 12, before that, in the last book, verse of Acts chapter 12, that Paul and Barnabas were returning from Jerusalem to fulfill their mission, and they took along with them a young man by the name of John, whose nickname was Mark. I wonder if anybody knows about the story of John Mark. John Mark was going to aid Paul and Barnabas on their missionary journey. He was going to be their helper. He was younger, but he was willing to help. But it says in Acts 13, at the end of that verse, while they're on their missionary journey, this is Paul and Barnabas, that young John Mark left them and returned to Jerusalem. The Bible doesn't say why he left. But Paul didn't take too kindly to him leaving. Paul, I think, the Bible implies that he left because he didn't want to, he was too fearful, maybe. Just couldn't continue on. It was maybe he was sick. Maybe he did, there's a lot of reasons. We don't know why. But he left. And in Paul's mind, he'd abandoned them. So he left. And as the second the first ministry journey ended, they came back and told about all they've done. And a couple of years had a years had passed, and they were getting ready to go back on a second missionary journey to revisit all the things they had done on the first one. And it says in Acts chapter 15, in verse 36, that a discussion arose between Paul and Barnabas about taking John Mark again as a helper. It says. And after some days, this is verse 36 of Acts 15, and after some days Paul said to Barnabas, let us return and visit the brethren in every city in which we proclaim the word of God and see how they are doing. Makes like a perfect sense to go back to check on them. And Paul, and Barnabas says in verse 37, was desiring to take John called Mark, along with them. He was thinking, he did it the first time, let's do it again. But Paul, verse 38, but Paul kept insisting that they should not take him along because he had deserted them on the first trip and not gone with them on the work. Unfortunately, 39 is in our Bible, but, it, but God had a purpose for it. And there arose such a sharp disagreement between these two men of faith, between Paul and Barnabas, a sharp disagreement that, that separated them over the issue of taking John Mark on the journey. Can you picture it now? Barnabas, we know how he is. We know he's an encourager. He knows he's going to be uplifting. He said, oh, come on, Paul. Let's, let's, just, let's, let's give him another chance. Let's do it. Let's have him come. It won't be like last time. He's a little older now. A year older. Paul said, nope. Nope. He showed his colors the first time. He's going to do it again. He's staying home. No, nope, I think he should go, Paul. No, nope, Barnabas, he's not coming. Okay. Let's go our separate ways. So, Paul chose Barnabas. I mean, cho uh, Paul chose Silas, verse 40. And Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed to Cyprus. It's very interesting that Barnabas was willing to leave the great Apostle Paul to choose who Paul would say a failure. Someone that gives up. Someone who's not cut out for ministry. But Paul chose him. Paul said, I will give him another chance. Mark it says in the, book, in the book of Colossians, you know why, one of the reasons why he picked them? Because they were relatives. That's his cousin. Mark and, and Barnabas were cousins. So I guess family is, is pretty important, isn't it? So Barnabas picked Mark and they went their separate way. And it's interesting how if you read the rest of the book of Acts, do you hear much about Barnabas? What do you hear? Paul, Paul, Paul. And we don't really hear much about Barnabas. But I can just picture that day they separated. Barnabas taking his cousin Mark 
who probably felt lower than dirt. Paul, give me another chance. Nope. I'm taking Silas. Have a good day. I can see Barnabas saying, putting his arm around Mark, come on, buddy. Let's go home. Cyprus was their home, you know. And I'm sure Barnabas and Mark did good things. Actually, I know they did. Because you know who was the author of the Gospel of Mark? This same man. Where, maybe I think to myself, where would the Gospel of Mark be? But not for Barnabas. What if Barnabas turned off his gift for a day? Say, you're right, Paul. You're right. He's probably going to do the same thing. Mark, go home. We're going to do the God's work. I wonder what would happen to Mark. Boy, if my own cousin doesn't believe me, maybe I'm not cut out for the work of God. But he didn't. But he was willing to use his gift with not just the Apostle Paul, who was Saul then, but to use it again on a man named Mark. I mean, because he did, we have 14 books of our New Testament. If you count the 13 of, of Paul and of the Gospel of Mark, half of our New Testament was written by these two men because one man was willing to use his gift of encouragement to keep them going. That's a wonderful thing. And that's an amazing thing. We can thank a lot of our New Testament because of one man. Thank you, Barnabas. He wasn't a special man. He wasn't a, a super apostle or a super Christian. He was just someone not like me and you, using what God has given him to help others. And today we live in a world that's down, dark, depressed, fearful, wondering what's going to happen next. I think God's looking for some Barnabases to go and to find someone that's down in the dumps ready to give up and to use their gift and say, come along. It's okay. We'll get through this. It goes a long way, doesn't it? And you know what? If you read 2 Timothy chapter 4, I want to just read this verse to you. Forgive me for saying this, Paul, but you were wrong. I think you, you'll be okay with that. Paul, you were wrong. Yeah, I'm sure you had good reasons. He even says he was wrong in, in so many words. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 11. This is the last book chapter he wrote on record. He was about to go to the, well, I wasn't guilty, and was about to go to the sword. History tells us that they were about to behead the Apostle Paul for just being a Christian. He was in a Roman dungeon writing this, and he says that Demas had deserted him, loved, loved this present world. Only Luke is with me. But don't miss what Paul puts in verse 11. Almost like, by the way, Timothy, by the way, pick up Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful for me for ministry. You see that there? Mark made it. Mark made it. How did he make it? Because one man a cousin, said, Mark, we're going to give you another chance. And he made it. You don't know what one simple act of kindness, one simple word, one simple arm around the shoulder can do. And Mark is a testimony to that. Fourteen books were written by two men that were influenced by Barnabas. I want to just give you five takeaways from 
from this life of Barnabas that we can use today. Here's my first one. Barnabas believed in the power of God for salvation. Barnabas believed in the power of God for salvation. When Paul was first saved, even though all the else doubted it, Barnabas believed it. You know why he believed it? Because I think he knew that God could do anything. If God can raise Christ from the dead, which is, was impossible to them back then, and today, of course, if he could do that, he could do save anyone for the work of his ministry. So Barnabas believed in the power of God. How do we believe today? Do you believe God could do anything? God can do anything. Nothing stops God. Even saving a persecutor of the church to do so many things for him. He believed in the power of God. Number two, he was available. Barnabas was available. Available. This is so important. Because many times we find ourselves so busy that we don't get the chance to help and encourage someone that really, really is looking for it. Who needs it. Barnabas was available. He was available for a, a, for a call in the middle of the night for someone that just needs someone to talk to. He was there. Of course not. I'm using that for us, obviously. <laughs> he didn't have phones back then. But he was available. And I think I asked myself, am I available? Sorry. Am I available for others who are needs? Can I be like that colleague who took the time out of his schedule to walk into that office and just sit there and not say a word? Am I available? Am I willing to do that? Am I available? That was Barnabas. Number three, he was willing to challenge believers. He was willing to challenge them. Because remember in Acts chapter 11 when he got to that church in Antioch? Not only did he witness the grace of God there, but he also challenged them to remain true to the Lord. Because false prophets and, and, and misleadings were starting to creep up in the church and he wanted those believers in Antioch to start to continue on being child, uh, faithful in the, in the Lord. So Barnabas was a believer in the power of God. He was available. He was willing to challenge new believers. He wasn't scared to speak up. He was willing to challenge them. Number four, he was willing to be a disciple. He was willing to be a discipler. Oh, we need this today, don't we, Pastor Bill? We need more disciplers in our churches. Look what is in Acts chapter 11, verse 25. After they told, they tell us about how he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit. It says in Acts chapter 11, verse 25, that Paul, uh, that Barnabas left for Tarsus to look for Saul. That word look or that, that, that sentence where it really means he hunted. He searched diligently for Saul. I think he saw something in Saul. And he wanted to investigate that. He searched for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. And it became that about that for a entire year, Paul and Saul, uh, Saul and Barnabas met with the church and considered numbers of disciples were, were added and first called Christians in Antioch. Barnabas was a discipler. He sought out, he hunted for Saul with the purpose of leading him on, keeping him built up, keeping him encouraged, keeping him challenged, keeping him willing and ready for the ministry. We need Barnabases today. We really do. Not just to be an encourager, but to be available, to be willing to challenge and to disciple. And lastly, number five, we need this also. Barnabas was willing to give second chances. Barnabas was willing to give 
second chances. And of course, I'm referring back to John Mark. And because he gave that second chance, of another believer continued on in the Lord. It's a wonderful thing, isn't it? It's not by accident that Barnabas is in here. It's for our encouragement, for our learning that we learn from him this morning. Pastor Bill, I, I just wanted to tell you this morning that when you, when you sent me that text about uh, maybe filling in here, you probably don't know this, but that encouraged me so much. You know why it encouraged me so much? So I want to share with you a letter. I'm just going to read it quick. And we're going to close in um, Acts, I mean Romans chapter 15. Let me read this letter to you. To Claremont Bible Church. Hello, my name is Brett Erickson. I've been led by the Lord to write this letter to the church. The Lord has recently burdened me about what's going on at Claremont. Claremont Bible Church is a special place to me. I was born and raised in the church in the 1980s. I was dedicated in the church in 1982. I was saved in the church in 1992. Right out there. My parents were saved and baptized in the church in 1976. I am currently preparing for ministry, and I have been serving the Lord for these last 10 years at Bible Baptist Church in Ghent, New York. But recently, the Lord has leading me back to my roots, and my roots were planted at Claremont. It would be honor. It would be an honor for me to come back and speak to the church, if possible. I would love to share what God has done in my heart with you all. I hope you will have time to listen to a CD I have enclosed and mail to you. May the Lord Jesus bless you and thank you for your time. Signed, Brett Erickson, May 2010. Mailed here 12 years ago. And here I am. The reason why you encouraged me, Bill, and everyone here, because it proved to me that God always finds a way to answer prayer. He does. 12 years of praying. And I'm here. Thank you for encouraging me this morning, Claremont. You probably don't remember that. I don't know if you were even, and you were even here in 2010, but I did mail that here. It might even be in the filing cabinet somewhere here, here in here in the church. Let's let's turn to Romans chapter 15 to close with this morning. Romans chapter 15. This the same Apostle Paul wrote this chapter. He gave these powerful, powerful words. Starting in verse 4, Romans 15, 4. For whatever is written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the Scriptures, we may have hope. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accordance with Christ Jesus. And this is what I want to close with this morning. Do you know encouraging others what it really ends up doing? It ends up doing this. Together, you with one another in one voice may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. That word, therefore, in verse 7, is referring back to the verses previous that Paul is writing. That through the encouragement of this book, 
through encouragement of others that you come across, ultimately, ultimately, is for God's glory. But Barnabas is in our Bibles. And for what he did for Saul and what he did for Mark, ultimately, in the end, is for God's glory and His alone. This week, if you find someone to encourage with maybe a text, and many people don't do this anymore, handwritten letters, so special. Maybe a phone call. Maybe if, you're willing, if you haven't had the access, get to some, go see them. And give them just an encouraging word and maybe a verse. You doing that is not just for you and the person you're encouraging. It is ultimately giving God glory. One man using his gift is giving God the glory. I thank God for Barnabas this morning. I thank him that he was willing, just willing, to use what God gave him so he can encourage others, so they, those ones he encouraged would write half our New Testament and they would be here this morning talking about him. All for the glory of God. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, what a special day this is for me because you are good Lord you don't stop amazing me I thank you for Barnabas thank you Lord that you were willing that he was willing to just be used all for your glory we thank you and we thank you we thank you and Lord let us be like Barnabas this morning no, we're not going to speak to people that are going to help write our Bible. But we might speak to people that will help those who are just needing some help. And ultimately, it's for your glory. We thank you for that. We give you the praise, the honor that's due your name. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' wonderful name we pray. Amen.